If you don't know Matt and you haven't heard of Blue Apron, uh, it's refreshingly easy to grasp. You guys do basically perfectly portioned uh, meals right at your doorstep and recipes, right? Yep. And uh, three years in, you have 3,000 employees, a couple hundred million dollars of revenue, and uh, the last reported number was, what, five million meals delivered per month? Yeah, that's the, that's the, the most recent thing we've announced publicly, five million meals a month. So um, give the audience a little bit better description than I just did of what you've been able to build over the last three years. Yeah, sure. So um, at Blue Apron, our mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everybody, which is a really broad mission, but something that's really meaningful to us. Um, and the core of what we do is we deliver recipes that we create every single week and all the ingredients, you need to cook those recipes in the right amounts. Um, but really what we're doing is we're transforming a food supply chain and building a new food system in this country. And what that means is we're cutting out middlemen, we're doing a number of things to really reduce waste all along the food system um, to get people fresher food at better prices and working with our suppliers to really help improve their practices um, you know, overall for the better. So it sounds like um, you kind of position yourself more as the grocery store of the future than like, you know, Amazon is doing meals of some sort as well, meal delivery. Every startup, it seems like, is in this food space now. So I, how do you kind of position yourself in such a hot space? Yeah, well, I think, you know, sometimes um, people compare us to a broader ecosystem of people who are trying to get you to eat at home. And we don't think about ourselves as a business that is fundamentally about eating or a business that's about cooking and learning. And so we named the company Blue Apron because chefs around the world wear blue aprons when they're learning to cook. And so for us, that's a symbol of lifelong learning and cooking. And what our customers really get out of cooking with Blue Apron is that experience of making a home cooked meal at home that you're sharing with your loved ones, that you're learning about ingredients, you're doing it yourselves, and you're making something that you can be really proud of. You know, you take a minute, you step away from your iPhone, your computer screen, your TV screen, and you're doing something with your hands that you're really proud of. You know, and if you, know, if you were just looking to get full as quickly and cheaply as possible, you could go to Domino's Pizza or something like that. But we're really about that experience and getting people to um, learn and share that time with their loved ones. So I agree that cooking seems to be the heart of what you do. And I've tried it. It's definitely, they make you cook. It's not necessarily the easiest stuff to, to make. But you are proud, I guess, at the end. Yeah. Um, however, the idea of delivering food and meals and things isn't exactly a new one. And like one of the biggest horror stories, to be frank, of the early dot-com bubble was Webvan. Yeah. And uh, so what, what happened then, and why aren't you going to do the same? Yeah, well, our business model is basically the complete opposite of a business like Webvan or a business like Fresh Direct. You know, from the very, very early days of the company, we've been really focused on doing a very small core thing really, really well and with strong unit economics. And so if you think about what we do every week, we have 10 recipes and we send um, a box, which is a combination of those recipes, to people at home. And because of the, the efficiencies in our model, it allows us to do that pretty effectively. So we get to buy a limited number of SKUs at high volumes. Um, we, we have better planning capabilities because we have these soft subscriptions with our customers. And so we know ahead of time approximately what our demand is. So we're not taking on perishable inventory and we're able to cut waste out of the food system that way as well. Um, and we're curating recipes, and so we can design recipes around the supply chain um, because we're selling recipes to people, not a specific ingredient. And so um, all of those things together actually allow us to manage our business really, really tightly. And we've been very careful not to overextend ourselves to try to be all things to all people, like a business like Webvan, you know, which was trying to do like on-demand deliveries of tens of thousands of items, you know, with a perishable supply chain. Um, you know, our business, the model, is deliberately built around a capability that allows us to carefully manage perishability in a really high-quality way. So a few things you touched in there that I want to dive a little deeper on. But the first is your subscription business. Yeah, you're getting people to pay a crazy amount of money. Like it's one of the highest subscription products I can think of. I mean, you're what is it, sixty dollars a week? Because um, you can't order a one-off meal really on Blue Apron. It's you're ordering. I think the lowest product is sixty dollars. The highest is seventy. We have two options. We have a couples plan and a family plan. Our couples plan is nine dollars and ninety-nine cents per person per meal. You get three meals for two people a week. Our family plan is $8.74 per person per meal. And you can either get two meals a week or four meals a week. So that's either $70 or $140, um, depending on what you order. The price point is 
really high relative to I mean, that's per Netflix. Week. That's not even per month. However, the price is really low relative to buying that food yourself at a grocery store, and people are eating and shopping on their own anyway. We've actually gone out and shopped for our recipes at grocery stores all over the country. And for an average grocery store in an average city, if you try to recreate our recipes yourself, it would cost you like 60% more to do that. Um, and so that's because of the supply chain efficiency we have. We also, by the way, on top of it being cheaper for, with us, we deliver it to you and do the legwork for you and get you the recipes. So there's even more value on top of that. We don't, of course, charge for delivery um, or anything like that. Um, and so there is this, despite the fact that the price point is high, which is really great for us because it allows us to generate revenue, it's a really good value for customers. Yeah, I mean, that, I, like you said, it's way, way higher than Netflix. I think, what is that, $10 a month or something? And people are paying you like tens, 60 or whatever per week. Um, so how, are, how did you find this amazingly beautiful subscription product that a lot of people wish they could have in their businesses. And how do you keep, keep people from churning? Because at that high price point, people are going to say, is this really worth it, you would think. Yeah, well, like I said, the price point is high relative to Netflix, but low relative to shopping on your own. So there's a great people um, stick with us because we're saving them money. And we hear all the time that we're saving people money. But it's not just about the money. It's about the experience and how we help people feel about themselves. I mean, it's most people's best memories growing up with their family are having a home-cooked meal around a table with their loved ones. And that's an experience that people have really gotten away from you know, in recent years, is you know, sort of McDonald's took off, and frozen dinners sort of became popular after World War II. Um, there's a little bit of a lack of culinary skills, but people still have that emotional excitement and attachment to that meal that you're preparing with your own hands. And so, um, that's one of the reasons that our business has taken off and grown so quickly. It's because people are emotionally involved with what they do, with what we do, and they share it with other people and tell other people about it. Um, and so, um, you know, we have to continue to offer great experiences. We have to continue to offer great food. We have to continue to offer great value. But when people um, try Blue Apron, um, you know, for many of our customers, we just become their lifestyle, and they stick with us for very, very long periods of time. And you told me just backstage that from day one, pretty much, you've been making money on every meal that you sell. Yeah, on a variable delivery. Every, you know, we've always been focused on that. Where, you know, some people uh, in e-commerce traditionally gets, get, you know, e-commerce gets a bad rap because they're known to be capital um, intensive businesses. But we've been very focused since day one on our business, and it's actually been reasonably capital efficient for us to do what we do. Um, because we're very careful about our unit economics. Actually, one of the very first things I did when we came up with the idea for Blue Apron was to like sketch out on a napkin exactly how we would make money on a delivery. And so, you know, we've been, so we've been focused that on math? that day one. Well, you look at what your costs would be. I mean, you say, hey, if we charge 60 bucks for a delivery and it costs us this for food and this for shipping and this for fulfillment, you know, is there money left over for you at the end of the day? And fortunately, um, because of all the supply chain efficiencies we've built into our model, because we're really good at fulfillment and execution, and it's been a major focus of our company since day one, the logistics of what we do, um, you know, it, it works out really great for us. Yeah, so walk me through, a lot of e-commerce companies get into this mistake where it's so easy to say, like, well, how fast do you want us to grow? Because we can pour a ton of money into marketing and get a lot of users really fast, um, but they're not going to necessarily be loyal. So how do you think about um, how much you spend versus achieving the lifetime value that you want from a user? Yeah, so we've been measuring lifetime value of our business since um, literally the first week uh, we had customers when they were just my friends who I begged to try our product. Um, you know, and so that's been an obsession of ours. And our marketing team, every single week looks at on a really granular basis for every kind of marketing channel and strategy that we have, obviously what our cost to acquire is. And we look at that relative to the expected lifetime values, which we measure historically and also predict proactively based on early, perce early um, perceived customer actions. And so um, we can manage our marketing spend to specific time periods of paybacks, depending on how aggressive or not aggressive we want to be with our marketing spend. And so you know, our marketing spend happens to pay back really quickly. And we have um, internal rules that our marketing team lives by on a weekly basis that says, you know, this is the payback that we want to get on our marketing dollars. Um, so one thing that also came up is uh, Fidelity is an investor of yours. 
And there was recently all this press about uh, somehow Fidelity's documents leaked, and it seemed like they had written down a bunch of their investments. Not Blue Apron, but things like Snapchat, they marked down 25%. And everyone was like, oh my god, the tech bubble, it's here, or whatever. Um, so when you see something like that happen, is it a sign of down times? Does that make you worried? I mean, this is one of your investors marking down investments that yeah. they've made, and someday it could be you. Well, the f first thing that I, I'll uh, slightly correct you on, which I'm sure Fidelity would appreciate that I'm going to correct you on, is that it didn't leak. Um, this is, they've been publishing this since the dawn of time. I think it's just their, the law that they need to do this. And so they've been publishing marks on their private investments since long before they got involved with us. And nothing has changed. It just happens to be that the press started reporting it. So um, you know, I think that's more a, a mark of the times than something that Fidelity did. Um, but you know, it, something that you don't really pay a lot of attention to. You know, before I started Blue Apron, I was in the investment business, and I got to see firsthand when I was at um, Blackstone and at Bessemer, um, you know, the process by which those companies mark their investments. And it's not like a stock price. It's you know, it's not fair to interpret it that way. It's really an accounting function, and it's a reporting function, and there's it's it's more art than science, and so. You know, when someone marks down Snapchat, you know, a huge amount, it's because probably someone with more of an accounting function in the organization is saying, well, Twitter fell, you know, X percent. How can we justify that Snapchat didn't fall X percent? And so, um, you know, I think um, it's something that the press is overly focused on and is probably over-interpreting um, unfairly because there's not a, there's not a true uh, meaning behind that. That being said. You know, um, you know, Blue Apron hasn't been a part of this at all and, and is happy to not be a part of this. Yeah, but I mean, if Twitter falls, then things should get corrected. I mean, it is all social networking. I mean, that's how markets work. Yeah, I mean, look, it, you know, um, I don't know anything about Snapchat or, or, or that decision, um, but these are private investments. And, you know, if you're interpreting it to say, hey, holy moly, Snapchat as a company is falling apart now, I think. Um, that would be a misinterpretation of the fact that Twitter's stock price fell. And therefore, maybe the value of Snapchat relative to Twitter needs to fall also. So it's just a different interpretation. I think the press is interpreting it to say, wow, something's awful at Snapchat. So uh, you've actually had a lot of success now fundraising on the other side. You used to be at Bessemer, which is a big VC firm. And now you've got this big, successful company that seems like all these VCs want to be in on. Um, from your perception, what are things like right now in the fundraising and startup environment in general? Yeah, well, um, you know, we're not raising money right now. So I'm not in there on the day to day like some of the other companies. Um, we're fortunately, we raised a bunch of capital and we feel really good about our position. You know. What I'm observing as a casual observer, I guess, is um, that it's a little bit harder to raise money for really early stage companies. You know, there's a, there is a lot of capital for late stage successful companies, um, and you know, I think that that's a smart, rational thing for you know people to be looking at. It's easier than ever to build a really big and successful business. You can do it faster than you have been able to in the past. Which, if you think about what preferred equity investments are, um, they're limited downside with you know, upside potential because they have a preference to them. And so in a world where it's easier than ever to build a big company quickly, the, that means volatility is higher. And therefore, the value of an option, which is kind of what a preferred equity investment is, should go up. And so I think a lot of investors um, are understanding that. And that's one of the reasons that you've seen a, a rise in late stage valuations. And in my opinion, that's reasonably rational. So, um, but you do see VCs pulling back, I think, on the early stages um, for things that don't have that downside protection. Because on the downside, those companies could go bankrupt, obviously. So it sounds like there's a lot of money for good companies and not a lot for bad, which is probably Yeah, I mean, I work. think that that's a healthy thing. You, know? um, it, you do have to really show that you have a great business with great unit economics and a great market. And if you can do that, it's, you, know, you can find investors. And if you don't have that, it's hard to find investors. And, and I think that that's very healthy and, and the way it should be. So last question, because we're out of time. Um, but uh, so you launched Wine, which is awesome, uh, which I'm curious to see how that goes. That's pretty a new thing. Um, but I've noticed that you only tap into one meal as opposed to three, sometimes four. You can really only get to that dinner market. So breakfast, lunch, are you guys thinking about that at all? Yeah. you know, so. Um, 
strategically, what we're looking to do as we grow Blue Apron is obviously, we, we still think we have basically no customers in the grand scheme of the market, even though our business is reasonably big. So we're trying to get more customers doing what we're doing now, but we're, we're always looking to personalize what we do better and better. So how do we fit people's lifestyles better with more options, um, additional add-ons, um, you know, um, suiting your tastes and lifestyle better? So those are the kind of things we'll be thinking about. The first step in that was earlier this year when we launched our family plan, which has been really, really successful for us. Um, and you know, we launched our mobile app after that, which helps make it easier for people to manage their subscriptions around um, our business, um, and, and then wine. And so we'll be doing more things like that in 2016 um, as we continue to innovate and try new things. Great, thank you so much, Matt.